You got enough cameras? You never get access like this. A revolution. To go behind the scenes. I'm determined to enjoy it. To be a witness to history. Power is defined by its use. To be there every step of the way. The most significant international event. He's going to a war zone. Inspirational. As the decisions are made that will shape this nation's future under a new Prime Minister. I'll stand up for Australian values where we must. People feel as if a, a fresh breeze went through the country. But this isn't just a story about politics. I find it quite liberating. It's about love. I'm lucky. God? No one's ever asked me. Duty? And it's incredible privilege. Tennis. The only way I was going to get to live in a house with a tennis court. <laughs> And a side you never knew. I'm OCD. What you see is what you get. There's no such thing as a bad beer. <laughs> Come with me and see Behind the Curtain. It's a one and only interview. As the new Prime Minister and his partner Jody Hayden let you... It's a great insight into my personality. ...inside their world. Welcome, mate. Nice things. <laughs> their thoughts... Straight for you, head on. The defining moment. And I was lucky to survive. 20 years to the day. And their hearts. I love him and I love him deeply. Unconditional love. I'm really excited for everybody to get to see the Anthony that I get to see. It's extraordinary. What a show tonight. Good evening, I'm Michael Usher. When Anthony Albanese clinched victory in the federal election, he vowed to set the nation on a new and brighter course, all the while navigating an unrelenting cost of living crisis and the spectre of a rising China. Spotlight has been granted unprecedented access to his first frantic weeks in power. It is history in the making. As our new Prime Minister invites you into the lodge, his inner cabinet and into his heart, Here's Seven's political editor, Mark Riley. There's a lot of pressure in this job. In my three decades of political reporting, I've been told no by overly protective minders too many times to remember. Open government has too often been an open joke. So, what you're about to experience is rare and refreshing. Unprecedented access and unexpected revelations. I want to position Australia as a country that can be trusted. So let's start with one of Anthony Albanese's first flights overseas to meet world leaders. And the first television interview ever permitted with the serving Prime Minister on the Prime Ministerial jet. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Riley, R-I-L-E-Y. There it is. How's the job going? How are you fitting in? Well, uh, up to others to judge, but uh, I'm not taking it for granted and I'm determined to enjoy it as well. I think if you, if you don't, then uh, there's something wrong. But you have an opportunity to make a difference and that's an incredible privilege. So you've been close to a lot of Prime Ministers, particularly Rudd and Gillard, but is it different when you get into the job to what you imagine it to be observing? Well, it's different, but it's also, I think, the context of how it happened. Anthony Albanese elected the 31st Prime Minister of Australia. You had a Saturday election and then Monday morning, 9am, I was being sworn in. And then three hours later, I'd already done a press conference and was on my way to Tokyo and meeting President Biden, Prime Minister Kushida and Prime Minister Modi. So there wasn't really a chance to soak up the, uh, the, the aftermath of the election. What would your mum think? Here you are, in the front of the Prime Minister's jet, the Prime Minister's chair, the Prime Minister. Well, she, I, I remember when uh, I, I brought her down to 
Canberra after I was elected to Parliament. Uh, that was her first trip on a jet plane in her life uh, to see me sworn in to Parliament. 96. And so that was a big deal, uh, the idea that uh, we're on the Prime Ministerial plane, I think, would uh, blow her away. She'd be immensely, immensely proud. To my mum, Mary Ann, who's, who's beaming down on us, Thank you. If you'd have met my mum, you two would have got on. Uh, she had such a tough life, you know. She, she for a while, uh, I remember as a kid, she used to have to come down the stairs backwards on her, like, feet and... Uh, hands uh, because she couldn't walk down the stairs, was crippled up with mm. arthritis and with pain. She was in pain so much. She never complained. Mm. She never complained. She was joyous and she brought joy to people around her. And I've got a, a lot of her personality in terms of uplifting, optimistic, My mum lived in that one house her whole life, from 1936 through to 2002. I just feel a, a sense of, that's, that's where I'm from. I didn't meet my own father till I was 46. That's an amazing story, but you didn't know that your father was alive for a long time, most of your life. Well, my mum, she went overseas in 1961 yeah. on the Fair Sky. Uh, she met my father, uh, a relationship ensued, yeah. and she got pregnant to him uh, and told him, but he was marrying someone from the, the town in Italy where uh, he was from. Uh, and so she came home, and as a young Catholic woman in 1963 giving birth, uh, it was more uh, acceptable to uh, the family and the community to, to essentially have a story uh, which was that she was a widow rather than a, a single mum. It says something about the pressure that was placed on women uh, at that time. And so I was raised thinking that my father had died before my birth. She adopted his name. Yeah. Uh, she wore a, a wedding and engagement ring. That she bought herself. Uh, yeah. When I was old enough, uh, she told me it was very traumatic for her. And she was embarrassed. I certainly uh, told her that she was enough for me at the time. Uh, and for me, that was enough too. A matter of luck and good fortune and things falling into place. I, I did find him. Do you remember what the first words were that you said to him? Oh, it was uh, no words, really. It was uh, a hug is what I remember. Uh, he uh, came into the room and we embraced. And there were lots of tears that day. Such an amazing moment, though, and that, that whole the story is remarkable. The search and then finding him. How do you think that changed you as a as a man? I think it made me uh, much more at ease with myself. Um, once it, it once it had happened, uh, that sense of knowing who I was, so where I came from. Identity, self identity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Think about your personal narrative here. Bob Hawke promised, and you, you remember this very well, that no child will live in poverty. Can you achieve that? I'm not sure that anyone can achieve uh, no child. What you can do, though, 
is to do your best so that people aren't left behind. Because a child living in poverty doesn't just represent a, a, a tragedy for that child, but it also represents a, a loss for the nation uh, because you're losing the capacity of that child to grow into an adult and to fulfil their full potential and to contribute to society. Go to Sydney Uni, do economics. Absolutely. Come through the bare knuckle world of Sussex Street and become <laughs> Prime Minister. Yeah, absolutely. It must be very personal for you though. It must be visceral because of your upbringing. It is. from camp now, mate. <laughs> a, long, a long way, but still public housing. Indeed. Never Mission. take it for granted, let me tell you. Yeah. The, the tradition of Labor Prime Ministers living here rather than Kirribilia or in their own harbourside house, it's, it's one that you want. And why would you take that decision? Look, when you look at uh, the job of Prime Minister, you've got to represent the whole country. Yeah. And this is the national capital. Yeah. So inevitably, I will spend some time in, in Sydney, yeah. uh, but I'm finding more and more, this is where the bureaucracy is. Mm. This is where I brought all the premiers and chief ministers to this week. Yeah. Uh, I think the national capital should be where the nation is centred. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. the idea. Yeah. This is quite a big day for the Prime Minister, formalising his promise to significantly increase our international commitment to cutting emissions. Symbolism? Yeah, but also it will have a big impact on the energy market and the economy. This will be, uh, this will be pretty big. We've got a good range of people with us. Having business there today is, is such a a, a really important signal. We'll have the legislation ready when Parliament sits in July. Yes, we will. Did the Australian people vote you in or did they throw Scott Morrison out? They voted for us. We had a, a, a clear agenda. Uh, any election is a mix of both. It's a judgement of the former government, but it's also about the alternative. And we received a 4% swing. Uh, after having a devastating defeat in 2019 that could have very easily demoralised our entire movement and we could have gone inward into internal division. Under my leadership, we didn't do that. And the entire movement picked ourselves up, dusted ourselves off, had a review, used that review to outline a plan for the future and we came home. How was the first night in here? Oh, it was um, quite daunting yeah. coming yeah. here. There, there's been a number of moments yeah. where it hits you. <laughs> President Wadato and, and I just, we got on a bit like President Biden and I did. Like, it just, <laughs> it just clicked. Yeah. Where's the and bike, by the way? It, the bike's still. <laughs> In, in Customs Street, Prime Minister. Couldn't get out there. <laughs> All right. I, I got I through quarantine. I raised that with them last <laughs> night. I said, where's the bike? <laughs> Bamboo Bam bike. Bamboo bike. And so around here, might be all right. Around the lake. I mean, yeah. Canberra yeah. is is a beautiful yeah. city. Welcome, mate. Nice digs. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. Tell me about the artworks. Well, these were, have all been here. They're part <coughs> of the National Gallery. And this is a study. Yeah. <laughs> you can see. <laughs> that would go up if you put an artwork. Did Scott Morrison leave you a letter? Ah, uh, he did. What did he say? He did. Oh, it's a private letter. Where did you leave it? Uh, just on uh, on the desk at Kirribilli. That that's a tradition. That happened and good on him for doing so and I I thanked him for, for doing so. Hey, 
If you look at the desk here, yep. it was uh, given by the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester wow. in 1935. Well, this is the dining room. This is where we had the, the dinner with the uh, premiers and chief ministers. This room, there have been meetings from Menzies time through Whitlam. The Keating family sat around here Absolutely. at some point through the Howard years. A lot of decisions would have been made here. Yeah. Basing myself in Canberra mm. sends a message about respect yeah. to the public service. Mm. One of the things that had always struck me about my, uh, my predecessor was he seemed to be angry a lot of the time. I was like, mate, you're Prime Minister, cheer up. Uh, it's, not, it's not so bad. I'm the Prime Minister of Australia. That's an incredible privilege. Have you knocked on the door and said to the people who live there now, <laughs> this used to be my place, how are you going? I, I, I have over the years. There's <laughs> been uh, at least a couple of families uh, through there. I haven't recently. Let me show you this. Through. So this young woman lives in there. Hi, Mr Albanese. My name is Paloma Perez and I live right next to you where you grew up. It's great to see someone like yourself make it big. However, don't forget your humble beginnings. So what do you say to her? I'll never forget where I came from. Next, to my partner Jodie Hayden, thank you for coming into my life. One and only interview. No pressure. A big day. Absolutely. Right place, right time. He's uh, a really respectful partner. He's kind and thoughtful. He's very <laughs> French. <laughs> It was a big deal. I thought that was the end. Suddenly it hits me. I'm lucky. And it's love. Oh, OK. <laughs>
And from the moment I met her, she was so warm and friendly and took my hand she and said, so nice right. to meet you. So yeah. straight away, I, I just felt comfortable with her. It was, yeah. it was, so it was really You great. took your hand as well. He did, he did. He did. It's he did. French. It's very French. <laughs> Anthony doesn't do that. I might have to have a word to you about it. Yeah, yeah. It's very French. No, they were both just wonderful. The next day, Prime Minister Albanese prepared to leave Paris on a secret mission to Kyiv. That moment when Anthony left to go to Ukraine, that was a very touching moment. That was really hard. I, I've been doing so well all day in preparation for him going. I think it was the moment that we got down into the foyer and the team was lined up to say goodbye to him. And there were some hugs and some embraces. We get outside and the car's waiting and suddenly it hits me. He's going to a war zone. And there's a level of anxiety um, that comes with that. And also I see the car behind, which is all of his team. And of course, I've grown really close to them. It, it was overwhelming, you know, you're acutely aware of the risks. Impressive, courageous, smart, inspirational. This is a leader who's determined uh, to not bow before a much greater force. Putin's actions are the actions of a brutal uh, dictator, and that's why Australia has an interest in supporting the, quite frankly, courageous struggle that the Ukrainian people are engaged with. The Prime Minister returns safely to a much relieved Jody. I'm just so grateful that he's home, safe, as is the rest of the team. This guy, the Prime Minister, what was the moment you knew you loved this fellow? And what, and what should Australians know about him? There's probably many moments where I knew it was accumulating towards love. But I think for me, the defining moment was certainly when he was involved in that car crash. The federal opposition leader's Toyota wiped out by a pea plater last night whose Range Rover drifted onto the wrong side of the road. It was a big deal. Uh, a Range Rover heading straight for you, head on. Uh, I thought uh, that was it. That's how it ends. It was, uh, it seemed like it took a long time. It was just a matter of uh, seconds. Uh, but I thought that was the end. I want to show you this. When I got to, to the accident and I saw the car before I saw Anthony, and I remember thinking at the time, this, this can't end well. And the, the overwhelming sense of, if, what if I lose him? And I knew then that, um, that yeah, I, lo I love him and I love him deeply. She's an amazing woman. Yeah, it was a... Uh... Yeah, I'm lucky. And it's love. Yeah. As for what should everyone else know about him, I think Anthony has overwhelming compassion and that was something that I was attracted to, compassion and kindness. Behind closed doors, he's uh, a really respectful partner. Um, he respects me being independent, um, but also um, he's kind and thoughtful. The thing that strikes me is you're a product of this political environment. It's tough, you know that. It's, it, it is hard. You must feel incredibly protective of Jody going into that environment, knowing what might be ahead. Sure, it was... It's difficult. You know, she's not a political candidate. And I'm conscious of that, and, and so... so is she. In this life, 
which can be really difficult, uh, it is good to have people around you. Uh, you do need uh, that personal support. And I have uh, Jodie and I have Nathan, my son. Getting in your exercise, a bit of tennis or... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a hit with Nathan. He's already sledging me about how good he is. you got to go sort of around the oh. side there. Is Please. he rafter or is he curious? We'll He's a lefty. The only way I was going to get to live in a house with a tennis court. <laughs> I'm big white You feet. might need to go back just a little bit. Sorry, the okay, call <laughs> 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 Yeah, he takes his tennis very seriously. I am um, I'm not a gym guy. Yeah. <laughs> so I can play. Look at the gym you got oh, here. Gym. I yeah. can play tennis here for yeah. hours and yeah. hours. Great shot. Gotta get some new balls. Oh, okay. <laughs> Next, the point about the Morrison government was there was no point to it. The actions of a brutal dictator who has no respect for human rights. When you were sworn in as Prime Minister, you took an affirmation. I do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare. Do you believe in God? Keating famously said, change the government, change the country. For many years, the former Prime Minister from the right wing right the and the young Albanese from the left were wary of each other. But now they share the honour of having risen to the highest office in the land. So I called on Mr Keating to get his views on what this changing government means for Australia. Labor do your bootstraps. How did you feel on the night of the election knowing that Labor was back in power. Oh, well, a, a great relief. And I think it's true to say, even beyond me, Mark, uh, people felt as if a, a fresh breeze went through the country, you know, some sort of weight was left. Because the point about the Morrison government was there was no point to it. I mean, the point about the Morrison government was that there was no point to it. Uh, it was crisis management, but poorly managed crises, whether it was fires or vaccines uh, uh, or the economy in general. So, so this government, the Albanese government, will be a more uh, uh, orthodox government. It'll worry about both sides of the ledger. It'll worry about receipts and taxation, mm. and it will worry about spending. All this disappeared under those so-called managers of the of the economy, the Liberals. The superior <laughs> managers, they yeah, say. Yeah, superior managers. Yes, they'd forgotten who gave them the new economy, of course. Uh, you. You me, yeah. <laughs> but it was the economy which almost tripped up Anthony Albanese's election yeah. campaign before it was even out of the blocks. You got enough cameras? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're trying to get your good side. One of them, yeah, yeah. One of them will struggling. Catch you. <laughs> it's struggling. Do you mind clapping us, Yeah, sure. Oh, that's a bit So? How is he doing now? Action. I'll open with an easy one. What's the unemployment rate? <laughs> the unemployment rate is 3.9. Uh, Nailed it. Do you, is that on the top of your briefing notes now no, every day? No. no, we had... Look, I uh, during the campaign, uh, that was uh, an unfortunate uh, uh, day. National unemployment rate at the moment uh, is... Uh, I think it's 5.4. Uh, what did you think? Well, I, I'd been uh, I, I'd been told that I was going to get a question about what the relative unemployment rates were between uh, Labor in government and the coalition government. Right. And those figures are 5.1 and 5.7, respectively. So I had that in my head. I started off with five and then I actually went five point and then I was like, nah, it's a different question. So I then went four and by then it was too late. Uh, sorry, 
I, I'm not sure what it is. But, you know, things things happen. Things um, do happen. And I, um, I, 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 I owned it and, uh, and moved on. Yeah. Well, people are human. Even yeah. leaders are human, right? Absolutely. I want to show you something. Just have a listen to this young fella. Social policy is another area huh. that always bears the brunt of those obsessed with advocating smaller and smaller government. What they fail to recognise is that the legitimacy of market economies is only maintained by the provision of a substantial and comprehensive social security system. Rather than attacking social security recipients, I would like to see all of Australia's wealthiest individuals and companies pay their fair share of taxation. That He's young, all right, that young fella. That young idealist there. What would he think of Prime Minister Anthony Albanese giving sta stage three tax cuts to rich people? I mean, he'd just say, what? Well, what we did was uh, tried to amend uh, the tax legislation uh, that was before the parliament. We weren't successful. Um, you might be now, though. We weren't successful. Well, you need to give people certainty. And I'll tell you what that young bloke knew, which was that my word is my bond. And uh, we said during the election campaign uh, that we would maintain uh, the position that had already been legislated. Mm. That's a really interesting point, though. I mean, I understand that, and, and it goes to, you know, the integrity of the individual, and people want to believe their leaders. But you don't believe in this, surely. You don't believe that. At this time, with all the pressures in the economy, people doing it tough out there, people living below the poverty line, that giving tax cuts to the ultra-rich is a priority. What, what I believe in is, is certainty for people. And we said we would provide that certainty, and we will. OK. You're, so this is, this is an interesting now a evolution of your, of your politics. Young Albo would never have copped that, right? Oh, but... no, 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 no. That, well, that's where you're wrong. OK. Because uh, I've always been a man of my word. And, and I believe that uh, when you go to an election and you make commitments, you should stick to them. Bill Shorten. The only reason former leaders, in my belief, stay in the parliament is because they think there's a chance of them becoming future leaders. Have you had a blunt conversation with him and said, Bill, I need your loyalty and you need to tell me? Uh, he knows that that's the case. Uh, he's had uh, two shots at the election and, and wasn't successful. He now is a member of my cabinet. Uh, he's doing a good job and I'm very confident that he'll be a constructive member of my team. You're confident that you've got his absolute loyalty? Yes. The Republic. When? Certainly not in this term. Look, my priority for constitutional reform, I'm a Republican, to make that clear, but my priority for constitutional reform is recognising First Nations people in our constitution. Our history didn't begin in 1788. Uh, we should not only acknowledge that in the nation's birth certificate, we should be proud of it. And what we've had from uh, Indigenous Australians is a generous, gracious offer of reconciliation. And they're just asking for that hand to be joined of having a, a voice to parliament, uh, which is nothing more and nothing less than just good manners. That where matters affect First Nations people, uh, they should be consulted. Uh, it's not a third chamber. It has no decision-making power. Uh, but it would have influence on the way you make decisions. Of course it would, and it should. And when it's done, people will wonder what the fuss was about. China. Small word, big problem. Will you meet President Xi at the G20 if that opportunity is presented? Uh, if, if he asked to meet, I would always engage in dialogue uh, with anyone. It's part of my... my view of life as well. What would so, you tell him? I'd 
tell him that uh, my values are, are firm, Australia's values are firm. Uh, I want to see uh, cooperation with China where we, where we can, uh, but I'll stand up for Australian values where we must. And that's the key. John Howard used to say, we don't have to choose between China and the United States. But now we've made, we put all the, we put all the money on black. We put all the money on the US, right? And we can't afford to put all the money on the US. We've got to have a working relationship with the Chinese. And I think, uh, I think the Prime Minister uh, and the government uh, understand this. And that's why I think we are starting to see some thawing in the relationship. China deserves enormous credit uh, for lifting people out of poverty. It's an extraordinary uh, economic success story. Uh, but China is uh, seeking to assert itself in the region in particular, and uh, that's a decision for it to make. Uh, but Australia needs to stand up for our values as well. Australians are now paying Putin's petrol prices. Uh, the uh, attacks on the global supply chain are having an impact on our inflation and on our food prices uh, because of that increase in energy prices that flows through. So we're being impacted by this. And I think that uh, Putin's actions are the actions of a brutal uh, dictator who has no respect for human rights, no respect for international law. And this guy is, is murdering innocent people he is. in their apartment buildings, in their shopping centres. It, it is, to see it firsthand is very confronting. Uh, when you look at, we went to Erpin, just six kilometres from Kiev. And there you have uh, apartment buildings that have been blown to bits. People still live in there because they don't have anywhere else to go. Uh, houses uh, that have been just flattened. But people being determined uh, to, to not concede their sovereignty, um, they deserve our support. And we're there for the long haul. Absolutely. You're nominated as one of your three great <laughs> influences, of course, you know, the Labor Party, the Catholic Church and the South Sydney Rabbitohs. But tell me this, when you were sworn in as Prime Minister, you took an affirmation. I, Anthony Norman Albanese, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will well and truly serve the Commonwealth of Australia, her land and her people, in the office of Prime Minister. You didn't swear on the Bible, why? Uh, I'm, it's my personal view that there should be a separation of church and state. So that was a, a statement, a personal statement? It's it wasn't just so about me. I, I, I haven't made a statement. No one, no one's ever asked me, uh, but... It intrigued me because my background is not unlike yours yeah. from Catholic upbringing. And I thought, at that time, I thought, he's taken an affirmation. That's I really always interesting. have. I always have. Do you believe in God? Uh, look, I, I've always been, yes, basically. I believe in a, a, a higher spirituality and I, uh, you know, I, I don't talk about those things. I, re, I regard myself as being a Catholic. Uh, I have my doubts. Yeah, I believe in evolution and all of that. Um, it's a part of who I am. My my values, which are, are very much Catholic values. And I, I go to church occasionally. Uh, I don't uh, go every week, uh, but I go and it's a, a part of who I am. Do you go out and see your mum often? I do. Uh, I go uh, every calendar month I have in a little clock <laughs> that says, you know, it's, uh, it's June, have, have I been yet? It's July, have I been yet? Uh, she died on the 25th of May, 2002. And I arrived back from Tokyo 
on the evening of 25th of May 2022 and I uh, got in uh, C1, the car with the flag and, uh, yeah, went out to Rookwood. What she must have thought. 20 years to the day. Mums are special. They are. Coming up. The Queen. Yes or no? Favourite Aussie rock band of all time. So come that's on. a really big call. Yeah, come on. Probably the Oils. Rage! What makes you angry? Disloyalty. Under pressure, quiet or loud? Uh, determined. All politics ends badly. How does it end for you? Prime Minister, I'd like to put some questions to you, some rapid-fire questions for some quick answers, just to rattle through a few of these things. What makes you happy? Friendship. What makes you angry? Disloyalty. What do you love? People. And what do you hate? Uh, I think um, selfishness. The Queen, yes or no? Oh. The Queen, I think, is remarkable and has my total respect. The best Queen of England, the last Queen of Australia? I, I, I'm a Republican. Australia Day, change the date? I think that whatever date you pick, you, you're going to have an issue. I understand that it's a really difficult day for First Nations people and I respect that, but it also is a day when we talk about those issues which is important too. OK. Best footy? I think I know the answer to this one. Aussie Rules or Rugby League? Oh, Rugby League. Do you watch Aussie Rules? Absolutely. I'm a Hawthorne supporter. Right. Uh, well, you're not with the Swannies or the GWS? I'm a Hawthorne supporter. First grand final was the 89 grand final. Oh, Hawthorne Geelong. Ablett kicked nine in the losing side, won the Norm Smith medal, but Hawthorne ran over the top of them. Hawthorne had won their all-time aim of back-to-back -back flags. The spoils to the winners, but football a big winner as we depart the 80s. Here's you a know. tough one. Favourite Aussie rock band of all time? Oh, so come that's on. a really big call. Yeah, come on. Probably the Oils. Chisel. Powderfinger. Yeah, only one. Spider bait. There's <laughs> a lot. It's really hard. <laughs> I was lucky. <laughs> I think that my favourite bands are that era where I grew up, where you got to see all those bands in mm. pubs, relatively small audiences. And for me, the best music is still a small venue. Hello. Radio yeah. Birdman. Radio Birdman, I of course love. And they're still great. Hi, Anthony. Congratulations. We now have an ALP leader and Prime Minister who is someone that the uh, working person can relate to. Finally. Aloha. <laughs> Your best habit? Loyalty. Delegates, Stephen Loosley has just got to go. Under pressure, quiet or loud? Uh, determined. OK. All politics ends badly. How does it end for you? Well. <laughs> Uh, 
That's our program tonight. Thanks for joining us. Before we go, we'll leave you with some final reflections from Australia's 31st Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, in conversation with Mark Riley. And I'm honoured to be given the opportunity to serve as the 31st Prime Minister of Australia. My mother dreamt of a better life for me, and I hope that my journey in life inspires Australians to reach for the stars. I want to seek our common purpose and promote unity and optimism, not fear and division. OK, before we let you go, let's think big a bit. Paint in the horizon. Where do you, Anthony Albanese, Prime Minister, take Australia? What's the Australia you dream of? Uh, one where we have uh, a clean energy future, where we're dealing with the challenge of climate change. Uh, one where people have an opportunity, no matter how humble their beginnings, to succeed in life. One where we have greater equality, whether it be gender, race, religion, no matter who people are, that, that we're a more equal society. And one where we have common purpose going forward. Uh, less division, less argument, more unity. Prime Minister, um, thank you for the access you've given us, but not just us, our viewers, and we really do thank you for that. And for the sake of the country, go well. Thank you, mate. And uh, it, it's a journey that we're on, and one of the things about this journey is we're on it together. And, and, and I, if I want something to characterise my prime ministership as well, it is bringing people with us on that journey. And part of that is openness about what that journey entails. And hopefully uh, this is a part of that. So thank you to Seven for uh, this experience. Our pleasure. Go well.